we will move on then to Alasia's up next. And so buckle up. Oh, first, Sentient Devil, thanks for coming. Thanks for not trolling me so far. But uh, I know I'll eventually earn your wrath. So Sentient Dildo, I gotcha. Um, and Alasia's going to talk about books, and we're going to listen to her. <laughs> yeah. So um, for anyone who doesn't know me, uh, I feel lucky I've seen some of the big blockbuster hits. Uh, I don't, movies, TV shows are not my thing, books are. So I came with a book that I read in high school that has flown under the radar um, for a very long time. It was published in 82. And I, do you want to bring up, I have the book with me, but do you want to bring up um, the cover that yep. you found? Um, it's called The Blue Sword by Robin McKinley. And um, she is, so McKinley, let me back up. In the 80s, and again, I'm I'm probably one of the younger people here, so don't roast me if like you're like, duh, of course that was happening. But in the 80s, um, there was kind of this swing of female writers who were writing books um, of, uh, and they were using the trope of the the girl um, knight um, that they were the girls were starting to become knights uh, in armor essentially. And uh, Robin McKinley was uh, one of the very first I found. I'm not saying she's the first writer to do this. I'm just saying this, she's the first writer I found that did this. And then I, I went down the rabbit hole of like this trope because I love the girl might trope when it's done well and they're not Mary Sue's. I absolutely adore it. Um, and so Robin McKinley is the first one I ever read. And so I'm just going to do a real quick summary of this book. I, I haven't read it for a while. I started again last night and I got about a fourth of the way through it and I forgot how good it was. Um, and it's funny um, that you your book is set in India, um, uh, Zach's, because essentially this book uh, is kind of a retelling of the British Empire coming up against India, uh, against Iran and all those places. Um, but it's a, it's a fantastical story. It's a high fantasy story. Um, the, the quote, native population um, uh, are these magical tribesmen. They, they still can use magic. They still fight dragons. Like they still are part of the, the other world um, that as Tolkien describes it. Um, and this, this is a fan art and I've got some fan art too. Um, uh, the main character, um, uh, I believe his name is Korath. And um, he basically, he, he's the king of this tribe, this tribe of native, this native population. And this young girl from what we, what she is called the homeland, but it's Britain. She's from Britain. She's sent out there because her brother's on the, S, the, the, the furthest edge of this, of the homeland empire. And she's sent the, out there to live with him once her parents die. And he basically kidnaps her because his gift, the magic that flows in the royal line of his blood, tells him, you need to go get this girl. And so he goes back and kidnaps her. And um, she is trained to be one of his elite warriors. And um, she is actually chosen by the first queen of this race of native tribesmen um, to be her successor. And she gets the blue sword, which is the title of the book, the blue sword. And she's given a vision that not only will this, this, um, this kingdom of these tribe, tribe uh, people be overrun by these kind of elusive northerners that you're never really told a whole lot about. They just want to overrun everything and they're a threat to everything. They're also going to run, overrun the, uh, the Outlander Empire. And so she's given a vision um, uh, and come to find out she has magic. We don't know how, um, but she has magic flowing in her blood. And uh, she basically rallies the troop, but, troop and she is kind of like the key to everything. But again, I think, you know, now we're so like, we hate this trope. And I'm like, if it's done well, this can be a really good trope in fiction because she is the key to everything. She like they, everyone would be overrun by the Northerners if it hadn't been for her um, and holding the blue sword because the blue sword is magical in itself. Um, but she, she has to learn how to use it. Like with the first time she picks it up, it's so heavy in her arm, she drops it and she like, you know, gouges out the carpet. She, she has to learn how to wield it. She has to, and like these tribesmen, their horses, they don't use bits. And they don't use stirrups. They only grip with their knees, which I have done, and it's really hard. Um, she has to learn how to ride a horse. She has to learn how to fall. She has to learn how to speak their language. She has to learn how to do everything. She's not a Mary Sue who's like, all of a sudden she picks up a sword and knows what to do with it. She she has to learn, and she takes every bump and bruise, every saddle sore. It's amazing. Um, so, and what I really, really love and I really appreciate about this book, rereading it now, I what I think is amazing about it is that 
and I don't quite know how to put this, so I hope I make sense. There's that quote from the third Pirates of the Caribbean movie when the Kraken is dead on the on the um, beach. And uh, one of the other pirates says to Jack Sparrow, do you really want to keep running? Um, you know, the world is getting smaller. And Jack Sparrow says, it's not that it's getting smaller, it's that there's less in it. And I think this fits that book. It's like, this is like when magic is slowly seeping out of the world. All of the dragons are dead. There are no more unicorns. All the Pegasus, you know, Pegasi have been like killed. It, this is when mm. at the end of that magical other world. Um, and it's, it's at the edge of the empire. And these people are doing their utmost to protect it. Um, like the, the city that they live in is like her version of Minas Tirith, but it's crumbling. It's not going to last forever. There is a version of Rivendale and a version of Elrond, but he's the last of his race. There won't be any more. So it's like, it's the end of magic. And it's kind of like, there's a, there's a sweet sadness to it. Um, but she's like, we're going to protect this magic as long as we can, but it will die out. And, and magic hmm. will leave the world forever. So it's it's a really beautiful book, and it's it's not a long read. Um, it's actually quite quick read, but I absolutely adore it. And it was my gateway into um, fantastical um, literature uh, of this like night trope um, that I have read scads of, and I absolutely adore it. From especially from the eighties, hmm. I think the eighties were the peak of this trope of writing. Anything I picked up from the eighties has just been. I can't put it down. It's just so good. So anyways, that's that's a book that has been flying under the radar since eight, 1982, and I would beg you, please go get it. <laughs> that's awesome. That's really awesome. It's really great to see a lot of the things that some of us who may have a couple more uh, rotations around the sun on other people enjoying them. That's yeah. wonderful. It's yes. really great to see. It does and sound really cool. It It is. You know what? And I found out from Alicia bringing this up that I actually read these books, too. Mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. way back in the 80s and so like i see i this is my this is now i have credit because i like strong female characters so i guess no i'm not quite male feminist but uh i did like these books even when i was younger and there's a second one i think it's a yeah. prequel so it's a um, prequel so it's called hero in the crown and this is about aria which is the girl who forged the blue sword and she killed the last dragon that was threatening this these people um, she wrote them, I think, quite far apart. I didn't like the Hero in the Crown as much as I liked the Blue Sword, only because it's like, you know, when you read something, you expect, you kind of expect it to be slightly similar. And see, this was published in 2000. So Blue Sword's from 1982. This is from 2000. So that's pretty, that's a pretty large gap. So um, that's a huge gap. It's a huge gap. And I don't know what made her go back and write the story of Arya, but it was cool. it was okay. I liked it, but um, I don't, I, I didn't absorb it as well as I did the Blue Sword. Um, the Blue Sword, I think, uh, I read probably 15 times when I was in high school, like just like in succession. I just would start it back over because I loved it. And you said you were reading it over last night and you, you couldn't put it down. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, I'm a fourth of the way through because I have it on Audible now because I, you know, I, I, I'd like to listen to books while I'm, I'm doing stuff. And yeah, it's just, it's just so well done. Um, it, yeah. And it just, it captures this idea of like what it is to, cause she never loses her femininity. She still loves dresses. She's still, wow. loves yeah. Yeah. But she's a, she's, she's, she's wow. a knight. She knows how to wield a sword and she fights in battles, but she never loses her femininity. And of course she and the King fall in love and their love story is so touching and so beautiful. I just love it. So wow. yeah, it's really good. <laughs> Thank you. This Elisa. is great. This yeah. is wonderful. This is so great. You guys, I'm going to go find this book and reread this thing. Cause I haven't read this damn thing probably in 30 something years. And yeah. I know exactly this story, but there were so many good books like that, that mm -hmm. came out in the eighties. And mm -hmm. uh, I know the other one would be dragon riders of Pern uh, by yeah. Anne McCaffrey, another mm -hmm. fantastic series, of course, written by a woman, but Hey, mm -hmm. we didn't really care back then. It was just yeah. a good writer who happened to be a woman, yeah. but you know, other, that doesn't the other two that I would, narrative, does it? That I would suggest if you like Robin McKinley, Robin McKinley mm -hmm. has a lot of really great standalone books. She has two retellings of Beauty and the Beast. She has a retelling of, um, uh, uh, Robin Hood. Chalice is a standalone book, which I absolutely adore. Deerskin is really heavy, and it was hard to get through, but Deerskin was really good. Um, so she has a lot of really stand really good standalone books. She just writes about anything that strikes her fancy. She has a book about dragon riders. She has a sci-fi book. She has tons of books. 
So Rob mm -hmm. McKinley is a great one, but if you like this kind of night girl trope, um, Elizabeth Moon, um, uh, the deeds of Poxenarian are also, was, that was 85. And then Tamara Pierce's Tortull saga, which is about 18 books. She started that in 1984. So all these women were writing at the exact same time. Uh, Alasia, you have you do have a fan club, and it's not just because we want you to buy sundresses. Harley Dave <laughs> is actually asking whether or not you have an affiliate link on your channel that people can go to of books that you recommend. Yeah, um, so I don't have a list of books. Like, I don't know. So I do have an affiliate link. It's through AB Books, and I will get that for you. Thank you so much, Harley. Um, but you know what? I am working on somewhere where I can have a list of books that I would recommend. Um but I will, you know what, I'll try and put, like, throw something together and maybe post it on my Instagram. But yeah, I I should have a list of books because there are so many wonderful books, especially from the 80s. I think 80s was, like, peak fantasy, in my humble opinion. Agreed. So, yes. Agreed. Yeah. So, yep. but yeah, let me, no let me get this and I'll put it in the private chat so that, um, so that uh, our good man, Zax, can, can post it. And we know Rings of Power is going to suck, so let's look for other kinds of fantasy we can actually yeah, read. Yeah, absolutely. There's a lot out there. There's a term in behind me. There's a ton over here and up there that is stuff from the '80s, and and I never hear anybody talk about one of my favorite writers, Piers Anthony. And uh, we should do a show just on Piers Anthony at some point, but that's just my take on it, you guys. Good comment here from Melodic, Mel Melodic Method. If I could read. Um, Heart of Bronze was a believable strong female lead as well. Loved those that book and its two follow-up books. Alasia, do you know what those are? Anything? No, I haven't. I'm going to have to add this to my list. Ooh. Mm. Okay, there you go, Zach. There's the link. Oh, thank you. We're all learning. Heart of Bronze. <laughs> I, and the thing is, it's like there are just so many good books out there that like people don't even realize are in existence. You know, people are always throwing books at me. Have you read this? Have you read this? And I'm like, no, my, my, my list is just ever growing, which is not a bad problem to have at all, but I'm definitely going to look this up now. Yeah. Hey, link is in the chat. You're Thank awesome. Thank you guys. Thank you guys. Thank you, Alicia. Is um, there a male version of this uh, story? Cause I, uh, <laughs> I can't relate to it. Yeah. <laughs> well, are you a biologist? Flaccid? Are you a biologist? <laughs> am I? Am I a man? Yeah, I'm now questioning myself. You got to give me. I know. I know. Mm. What, uh, Flaccid? Have you read a book? H have I read a book? Yeah. Uh, yeah colored. Maybe he's colored know. books. He's colored books. I don't know if he's read them though, Zach. So let's be honest <laughs> about it. So. No, I've not read a book. That's <sighs> for losers and nerds.